Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is DDP back again for the Dallas Prospect. Voice has been a little bit up and down, so I'm a little bit late getting to this, but I want to talk about the New Look Mavericks uh, statement against the Thunder on Saturday. It's one thing just to see how the new guys were going to integrate. I was curious to see that, especially with OKC being, you know, pretty much this whole stretch of the first half of the year, if not the best record in the West, then right there, right behind the Timberwolves. Um, so seeing how they were going to do with this test was going to be interesting. Plus, OKC had a long layoff. Their previous game was Tuesday, so they had several days to prepare for this game. And I had a fairly good feeling, the energy and the vibes, to, to use an old phrase, the vibes would be immaculate. I had no idea that Dallas was going to blow the doors off of a very, very good Thunder team. And really, you know, as much as we look at this, you say like, oh, well, yeah, they won – by 35 points, 146 to 111. But really throughout this game, they were just dominant. OKC only outscores Dallas in one frame by eight points. Meanwhile, in the first quarter, the Mavericks had a first quarter scoring record for the franchise with 47 points. Jumped out to a 13-2 lead with Luka knocking down a couple of threes in Lou Dort's face, which is certainly nothing to uh to bat your eyes at because Lou Dort is a fantastic defender but some interesting things in this game so you have PJ Washington and you have Daniel Gafford making their debuts but neither would start in this game they would come in about seven minutes into the game and immediately make their presence felt we'll get to that but Dallas jumped out over OKC early on like I said Luca picking OKC apart because OKC maybe just trying to mix it up a little bit, decided they weren't going to double Luka as much as some other teams typically do. Instead, they were playing a lot of drop coverage with Chet. And I get with Chet's athleticism and length, they're thinking drop back and preservation and trust Lou Dort to make up for that. Against most guys, that would probably work out all right. Not so much for Lou Dort because Luka is burying threes early on, crossing them up, getting them lost in transition, or excuse me, not in transition, lost in the pick and roll coverage. Uh, and at one point had him so lost that Dort's full throttle closeout led to him just blowing by the Luka pump fake three. And Luka had about 10 feet of space around him just to set his feet, take his time, and knock down another three. So really, really dominant start there. Luka had 18 in the first quarter. And early on, I kind of thought like, this is going to be another one of those Luka games where he's going to just go insane. And, you know, hopefully we get some nice stuff out of the rest of the team, especially the new guys. Not necessary. Luka, yeah, he ends up with 32 points, uh, 9 and 8 as well. But 18 in the first quarter and then ending with 32 is pretty ho-hum by his standards. Yes, it's a blowout in the end, but his usage rate was in line with what we would want. Much better. Sub-30 usage rate. Uh, feel great about that. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the interesting things here. Dallas is ninth, I believe, in the league in terms of its pace. That's going to go up with this group. Dallas murdered OKC. That's probably a YouTube not friendly word. Uh, unalived OKC in transition, 33-2 to two in this game. That's insane. I remember the days when we begged Dallas to get these kind of stallions, these guys that could run the floor, who could make athletic plays around the rim, connect on alley-oops with Luka. And to finally have that is just fantastic. 33 points in transition. The pace Dallas played with was fantastic. Um, and it really, holding OKC to two fast break points is also like remarkable. And that's indicative not just of, you know, doing a pretty good job taking care of the ball. Now they did have 12 turnovers, five of which, uh, led to open floor kind of fast breaks for OKC. But do the math. That means seven of those were dead ball turnovers. So OKC doesn't have that opportunity for transition points. That's great. That's really solid. And OKC, about the same. I think they had like 10 or 11 turnovers. So it's not like you were just getting out in the open. Like that's rebounding and just pushing the pace. That's taking the ball out of the net, pushing the pace. Love, love seeing that for Dallas. And the defense in general. Not just, yeah, 111 points. You might see that and say, like, ah, oh, man, like, is that really that great of a defensive performance? Or if you didn't watch the game, maybe you think OKC just scored a bunch of points in garbage time to make it look more respectable. That's fair to believe. But at the same time, 
Not really, because Dallas's defensive rating was like 104 points per 100 possessions for a very good OKC offensive team. And it's not just as simple as like, hey, Luke outplayed Shea Gilgis Alexander, and that's the long and short of it. No, this was like pretty much top to bottom domination. Dallas won the rebounding edge by 14. Did a good job, like I said, not allowing a lot of fast break opportunities for OKC. Then on their own merit, got out in transition. And the energy that you got from PJ Washington and Daniel Gafford was just fantastic. Um, I think they check in about the five minute mark and like less than 20 seconds in, Gafford gets an alley-oop dunk from Luka. Uh, A moment later, he gets another one. PJ Washington gets one. I mean, Luka is just, we know his vision. We know his passing. Having guys that'll actually have the size, length, and athleticism, who can finish, who can lurk around the basket and make these kind of plays is just sensational. Uh, Gafford, 19 points, nine rebounds, and a block in just 17 minutes off the bench. Whew. When you have Derek Lively back, he's not back tonight uh, against Washington, but when you get him back, you're basically going to have an absolute two-headed monster at the center position. And I've seen this observation made, some people kind of talking about like, ah, well, the Mavericks definitely saw that they wanted a Rudy Gobert type to put alongside Luca, but they didn't want to pay the Rudy Gobert price or, you know, the kind of character aura and con- not controversy, but polarization that Rudy Gobert brings to him. And so this was clearly their option. They got lively in the draft and then they traded for Gafford and the two of them combined make like as much as uh, Gobert does per season. So to have that is just fantastic fantastic for Dallas uh, especially when you consider Gafford's only 25 and lively just turned 20 I think today or maybe it was yesterday my days run together but the youth the value fantastic having that kind of depth you have a legitimate legitimate backup center a guy who could start for you and is capable of starting for you hopefully injuries aren't going to be a career-long thing for lively he's had a lot of bad luck with ankles and now a nasal fracture but having just a guy like this in reserve is fantastic because one-to-one on the floor, I don't think you're going to see much of a, an absence or a drop off, but when you have them together and you got that one, two punch at the center, it's, it's a, a kid in the candy store. It's everything you could want. So, uh, yeah, 19 for, uh, Gafford 14 for, um, PJ Washington. So, Fantastic there. Washington plays 24 minutes, goes 6 of 10 from the field, 14 points, 5 boards, and an assist. Great, great production there. Uh, Getting, what, 34 and 14 out of the two of them combined off the bench. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I will go for that. I will go for that every day of the week. So what I really liked about this game, other than just the productivity you were getting out of your, your new guys, seeing them shine. Luca's usage down, pushing the pace and transition. Great lockdown defense. And by the way, Lucas starting to finally, I feel like, get some recognition for his defensive improvements because they are very much deserved. But Dallas and their ability to make, make a very good offensive team in OKC just struggle. Like, yeah, Shea still had himself... A nice day. He ended up with uh, 25, 6, and 5. That's a nice day. He played 29 minutes because the score got out of hand. But being able to make life difficult for him the way that they did was very, very good. So this is from Istok Franco on Twitter. His kid put Maxi on Giddy, and that allowed him to sag off, not respect Giddy in the corner to shoot his corner threes. And that just cluttered the paint, which made it harder for Shea to operate. Um, and Dort, he's a very good, very, very good defender. He's an okay three point shooter, but he's not going to hurt you a lot of times from three. There will be games where he'll have a pretty nice performance, but him and Giddy on the floor together, both of them struggling to kind of find their buckets, put OKC at a disadvantage. Dort was two of seven on the day, one of six from three. So that's right there. That, that kind of sums it up for you when you got two guys in your starting lineup and the Thunder have basically run the same starting five all year. You got two guys in your starting lineup and they can't stretch the floor. And so defenders are going to sag off them. If you got a guy like Shea, whose strength is that mid range game and getting to the basket and his craftiness and everything that's going to make life difficult. So you might've just kind of put a blueprint out there for how to contend with OKC. 
being able to do that, uh, really, really valuable. OKC had 19 corner threes, but Giddy was three of nine and Dort was one of six. So Dallas, yeah, they'll they'll let you take that corner three. And OKC did a pretty decent job knocking them down and you know taking advantage, except for those two guys who weren't able to convert at a high enough clip. So you end up with OKC shooting 36% from three, 39% for the game overall. And Dallas running wild with their with their new uh, pick and roll weapons, their guys that are able to cut to the basket and finish uh, finish really congested, tough situations. Gafford had several offensive rebounds or just loose ball recoveries around the basket where he was just in a crowd. And I know Chet isn't exactly the biggest dude, but you're still dealing with a lot of length and a lot of athleticism and a tremendous reach that is going to make life difficult. And Gafford just bullied him. And how many times have we talked about the Mavericks being able to bully guys under the basket? Wonderful stuff there. Obviously, you're not going to have that kind of advantage every time. But seeing that and just being like, oh, this is what this team looks like when we have a guy or two who can do this. Just great stuff. By the way, Dallas shot 58% from the field, 39% from three. Uh, 30 assists as well. That's another thing I liked. I mentioned earlier they were a plus 14 on the glass. That was 54 boards compared to 40 for the Thunder. And the Mavericks did produce eight steals. So good opportunities for Dallas there that they took advantage of. I really like everything that I generally saw from the Mavericks in this game. I thought they had good balance. Josh Green, you know, six points, pretty ho-hum. But he still was able to make a couple of very nice plays. You have him, uh, the behind-the-back bounce pass in transition to Gafford to get him that rim-rocking dunk. That was nice early on. And it was just kind of one of those things that I felt established Dallas with where they were at and allowed them to extend a little bit. You know, it's not just that they had a, a franchise record, 47 points in the first quarter. The Thunder did trim this all the way down to four before the half. Like they, they did rally. They did make this uncomfortably interesting um, in pretty quick time. They're a very good team. Like I said, the thing is they put in a lot of work and grind to get to that point. And then Dallas basically said, okay, crack the knuckles. I'm going to hit you in the face again. I'm going to deck you in the schnoz. And that kind of put it away. Like the Thunder got it down to four, got hit in the face again, kind of trimmed it back to like nine. Maybe they got to seven again, but then it just started to blow open. And by the time you were getting to that late third quarter, early fourth quarter, it was kind of all she wrote because we went from a reasonably close game to, again, a 35-point route. And uh, that's no small accomplishment when you consider how good this Thunder team has been. The fact that they were coming off of a loss, so you already had their attention. You already, I think they got beat by Utah on Tuesday. So you already had their attention. They were already like coming in with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, especially with how tight that race for the one seed has been. But it just did not matter here. It's Talk Franco, by the way. Uh, I want to use this point he had here. He says, um, speaking of Kyrie, he said he scored with such ease and whenever it was necessary in this game. Yes, he had 25 on 11 of 19 shooting with eight assists and only one turnover. Kai at times can be so smooth and effortless that it's like he's kind of controlling a game even when you don't notice. Like, I had the impression watching this game that, like, yeah, Kai's been solid. And then I saw, like, yeah, 25 points, that's, that's not bad, but, like, 11 of 19, like, Oh, and with eight assists. Oh, and with one turnover. Okay. It's like some guys are so smooth and effortless. It doesn't have that same thing. It's almost like they sneak up on you a little bit. So having him as your your secondary option, basically your second option or your 1A, 1B, whatever you want to call them, is a really nice luxury. I know, shocker, spoiler alert there. But fantastic stuff from him um, in this game that definitely deserves some, some love. And again, shout out to is talk because that's one of those things that I don't even know that I had at the top of my mind to make mention of in this video until I was like reviewing my notes again, right before it and was like, Oh yeah, I did have that thought during the game of like, man, so good finishes. So tough in the lane, whether it's over Chet, whether it's weaving through traffic and just really, really a solid finisher around the basket. He had three or four plays like that. That kind of got my attention. But overall, it was just like, yep, just Kai being Kai, man. 
and he did it in a really efficient way. So shout out there. Uh, Dalton Trigg points out the Mavericks have the third easiest remaining schedule in the NBA down this final like 29-ish games. And uh, jumping on to that point is Mavs Film Room talking about uh, March 3rd, saying that Joel Embiid is probably not going to be back in time for that matchup. So another thing, whereas you're looking at like the strength of their matchup and difficulty they still have ahead, it's like, well, they've actually got a nice opportunity here um, because of that. And not only is it the third easiest schedule remaining in the league, it's the easiest remaining schedule in the league or in the Western Conference, because the only two teams with an easier remaining schedule are Boston and Orlando. So very big opportunity there for Dallas to do some damage here. Let me see a couple of more points I want to make here. This is from Grant Afseth on Twitter. He's talking about Gafford's 19.9 rebound performance. He said it was his 293rd regular season game and the uh, 11th time scoring 19 plus points. So we said in the stream we did the other day when the trade happened that Gafford's not an offensive guy, but you know he can do what he did in this game. He can finish around the rim. He can be strong in the paint. He can get you putbacks. You're not going to run anything through him. You're not going to let him ever post up. But in these situations, he can do a little something, something and uh, make do. And that's, you know, Again, a lot of what we see in Lively, so that's great. He played uh, 20, uh, 20 plus minutes in his previous 10 performances in which he scored 19 points. Obviously, he had 19, or excuse me, 17 minutes in his Mavericks debut here. So make of that what you will. Stat Muse points out um, in the NBA this year, starters with a 70 plus percent true shooting percentage this season. That's a minimum of 10 games. They are Derek Lively, Daniel Gafford, and Dante Exum. They all play on the Mavericks. That's kind of interesting, worth worth mentioning. Mavericks now riding a four-game win streak. Well, they will look for a season-best five-game winning streak tonight playing a not-good Washington team. The Wizards are just 9-43, and 43, and uh, they're working on their fifth losing streak of six-plus games. That comes from Chuck Cooperstein. So, yeah, uh, I knew Washington was bad. I knew their record was bad. I was not aware that it was their fifth losing streak of six plus games that they're working on at the moment. So that's interesting. I mean, don't take it for granted. I think they was one of their wins this year over the Thunder. Actually, there was something where they played like one of the best records in the league and like got them as one of their wins, I feel like. Or maybe I'm conflating that. But there was something weird like that. Give Chuck credit here because as he points out on this same thread, Mavs have not trailed in nearly three full games. Good googly moogly. I was not aware of that. I, I knew that they were largely in control of these three games. I guess I didn't take notice that they weren't ever trailing in any of those games. So yeah, and uh, closing this out, I want to do, I don't normally make a point of giving attention to, I think, clickbait articles. Because there's no point when someone puts out a hot take prediction. But you do have a Bleacher Report post today with their bold post-trade deadline predictions. And in it, you have the prediction that the Mavericks will miss the playoffs again. The weird lack of respect uh, that PJ Washington and Daniel Gafford seem to be getting, whether it's the them getting graded a D uh in the the actual trade by bleacher report i think it was or this article here is just kind of baffling like don't get me wrong i get it at the time of the trade the mavericks were sitting at eighth very inconsistent had a lot of health issues up and down but the reason that they graded this trade so poorly was because of previous moves they graded it poorly because of the grant williams thing not working out here they graded it poorly because of a separate trade like they're looking at that and they're saying like oh well you went from all of this asset to this and uh, that's just not an efficient way to get there. Who cares? That's a separate conversation. That's a broader conversation. Like that's like if you're in GM mode and you're trying to grade that way. But if you're looking at this in terms of like, hey, what's the score for this trade? Did they get better? Are they more dynamic? Are they a greater threat now potentially? Again, we talked about their offensive prowess. You're always going to have offensive prowess when you got a roster with Luca and Kyrie. But now you got the kind of pieces that they really, that really complement their strengths particularly. And you improved very much so on the defensive end as well with both of these additions. 
there's no reason looking at this team that I think, unless you have something knock on wood, catastrophic happen, there's no reason I would anticipate them missing the playoffs. But the article basically amounts it to, yeah, they pre- or we predicted last year it wouldn't go over well, and we're going to say the same thing here, even if they are um, making that prediction. It's basically like, well, we said last year they wouldn't, and they didn't. We said coming into the year they wouldn't, and we're going to stick our ground on this one. That's your assessment? That That's the, the assumption that you base it on? He'll point to the Mavericks being 14 and 10 this year when both Luka and Kyrie are available. Okay. What was the defensive rating because of the other parts around them? How much how much stock are we putting into it just being like, oh, we'll see when you have just Luca and Kyrie, it just doesn't work together. Versus how much are you looking at the actual unit and health of the team around them? This, this is why I have a hard time taking these sort of things seriously because they're looking at two-man combinations and extrapolating so much more from it than you realistically could. So it's a very strange thing here. Like Gafford's not going to fix a 22nd ranked defense. Gafford and Washington and a returning and hopefully healthy Derek Lively will certainly do a lot to do that though. Like what's the, what's the argument? What's the conversation here? You you're again, lining it up to say like this one guy who, you know, is going to be your backup center is your backup center is not going to fix this problem. Who said he was doing it alone? Who, who said that even he and Washington were doing it alone? Again, it's part of a greater unit. You're getting better at two positions, whether you want to talk about, you know, even if Gafford's coming off the bench, fine. You're getting better at two key positions, one of which, one of your great weaknesses was your defensive presence on the bench. Now you're able to address that. You're able to get better in that department. So why are we trying to say that, like, ah, everything's got to be Everything's got to be better if you want to make a substantial step forward. I don't think so. With, paired with their remaining schedule, which we've already talked about, paired with health, paired with the fresh energy and the fact that I'm not putting much stock into it. It's why I didn't make a video about it. But Grant Williams rubbing guys the wrong way, not really his act, his shtick wearing thin with guys. Uh, I didn't really talk about that because it just sounded like rumor mongering. I, I don't care. I don't even care what he said in his first press conference or whatever with Charlotte, whatever. I don't care. But the, the idea that like the energy wasn't noticeably different Saturday is, is weird to me. It's like, it's a different energy. You have a, one of the easiest strengths of schedule, the easiest in your conference remaining. And you addressed two substantial needs for your team. And did so not just in terms of like, oh, well, one of the needs was a guy that could shoot threes and kind of create his own shot. Okay, Washington. Oh, by the way, Washington's a pretty good defender too. Oh, and by the way, he's going to be helped helped anchored with Lively and the, also the new addition of Gafford. Like, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? Every, you're giving like two metrics that don't tell a full story and then trying to extrapolate something much bigger from it. And it seems like because you yourself keep saying it in the article, you're largely anchoring it on the assumption of, well, we said last year they wouldn't, and we said before the season they wouldn't, so we're going to stand our ground. The thing is, when you call it a hot take, you're basically telling everyone that you're pissing into the wind and hoping not to get wet. Like, you're not really basing it on a whole lot, especially based on what you've outlined here. So there's nothing to it. There's nothing to it. And I normally leave these alone. I do because it just feels like pointless conversation that they're trying to engage in and trying to rile up people for engagement. I don't I don't usually subscribe to that, but this particular one just kind of made me snicker a little bit more. I just was like, okay, all right. <laughs> Even if you want to pat yourself on the back, like, ah, well, had it before. So clearly I could never be wrong on this front. No, no, you're right. That's that's flawless logic there. I don't know why we're even playing these games. We might as well just give them an L in at least 80% of these games and uh, call it a day, right? You got to see. You got to see. But um, I've been way off on a tangent here. Looking at the game Saturday, the energy was different. The, the presence of bully basketball and the idea of pairing that with Lively when he comes back was fantastic. 
you know, what you thought you were going to get with Williams, you really didn't get other than maybe the first 10 games. Um, having that in a more fully realized form, even if you stayed basically the exact same in age, I think it was a difference of like 25 and 24 respectively. Even if that part isn't different, you're getting at least the realized version of what you thought you were getting in the Grant Williams acquisition. So that is worth everything to me. Like to me, I would say for the Mavericks draft deadline, draft deadline, trade deadline acquisitions, I would give them an A minus. I I think this is at the very least a B plus. Maybe the only thing that um, you know some people would have looked at. I know that they almost got Kuzma. I know some people wanted them to try and get Dinwiddie. He ended up choosing the Lakers, which I understand, but. They look at that, and the reason I say, by the way, I understand the Lakers thing is because he's going to have a bigger role there, um, and it's his hometown team. So I get that. But looking at those kind of things, I better understand um, why some people might still hesitate to give them an A or a, you know A plus even. But I think this was a very savvy um, deadline acquisition day for the Mavericks. Like you look at it in the context of. What can you do today? What is the best way you can rally today? It doesn't matter what they did last year. It doesn't matter what they did last offseason. It's a new day. It's another shot of the title. You've got to look at it and say, how do I get better today? How do I make this team better so that they can do something? And if you think that the, the Mavericks were not going to be better after these moves, if you think they were going to be better off continuing at the way, at the way they were in the form they were, you're just deluding yourself. So it doesn't matter that the Grant Williams thing didn't work out and they basically were, quote, determined to get rid of him. It doesn't matter that that trade involved, oh, well, you had a first-round pick tied up in that, and then you already jettisoned from that in the fastest possible way you could, and now you're having to tie up an additional first-round pick, which you had to get from OKC. It does not matter. It, do it doesn't. F them draft picks in this case. You have to build right now to make the best team you can possible around Luca and Kyrie. Certainly Luca, because you got to convince him to stick around after his current contract ends or at least gets down to the wire. So you don't have the luxury of trying to just keep your powder dry. That mindset has burned us so many times in the past. When they lost Jalen Brunson and they basically said, like, yeah we're Luca's like, yeah, I, we will, hopefully we can rally here. Let's see what they can do. Um, I know some of the bigger names are gone in free agency. Let's see what they can do. I'm trying to remember what the acquisition they made was. It was some basically G league player, hardly registers. I can't even remember the name off the top of my head here. No disrespect to the guy, but that was how they responded. And it was like, yeah, we need Luca to have a voice in roster decisions. And I know people say like, that's always a slippery slope. If your superstar gets involved in that, then you got to run the risk of them um, having too much power, too much influence, and just not knowing they're not experts on how to build rosters. No, but they can tell you exactly the kind of player that they need. And by the way, you should have been able to figure that out as well, especially when half the fan base at least was telling you as much for the last three, four years. So being in this position and having Luca pretty much on the heels of that, getting in that position, and now you get Kyrie. You're able to re-sign Kyrie. Now you're going to get, um, again, Williams didn't work out, whatever. But you get P.J. Washington, who Luka was very determined for them to have, it sounds like, on the roster. And you get a guy like Gafford who addresses the backup center position that he has wanted them to address for at least a couple of years. You finally do all those things in the span of one year. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, this is significant. We got Kyrie at the deadline last year, and this year we swung another significant trade. Pair that with the offseason moves that we made, and you know, again, whether or not they worked out, whatever. They've been aggressive. Wheeling and dealing in the roster is undoubtedly better than it was this time last year. So why are we trying to have a conversation about, oh no, what was that low first round draft pick going to be? He wasn't going to be P.J. Washington. He probably wasn't going to be Daniel Gafford. He certainly wasn't going to be the combination. So what, what are we talking about here? It's nonsense, man. Nonsense. I like to try and be positive here. And I feel like I have not been in my, my zen for a minute here on this. So we'll wrap it up with this. Let me know what you think. How impressed were you with the new look Dallas Mavericks? 
Have they fired a warning shot to the rest of the Western Conference? Should we be taking them even more seriously than we are? Let me know in the comments. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace!